Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so welcome to, uh, to Cambridge, welcome to Stock, um, and welcome to the tutorial day. Uh, you're in the uh, Microsoft uh, Research Facility in Cambridge, but we're at Microsoft Research New England, because there's another Microsoft Research Cambridge. Um, many of the members of the lab are here if you want to talk to them about maybe visiting us or something. I'd like to thank Paul Oka, who did most of the, uh, the organizing in my name and in Christian's name. Um, and in Yael's name, okay, if, if the truth be told. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Paul is there. And if you have a problem, you can come to me and then I'll go to Paul. <laughs> so um, okay, so I'm going to turn this over now to the chair, who is also from Microsoft Research, but another Microsoft Research. Research. Uh, and our speaker is also from Microsoft, so we have a monopoly going. <laughs> All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ravi Kannan. Just for the record, Ravi Kannan is the right pronunciation of the name. Ravi is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research in India, where he heads the algorithms group. Before joining uh, Microsoft Research, Ravi had a long and distinguished career at various universities, most recently at Yale University, where he was the William Landman Professor of Computer Science. So Ravi has won a number of distinguished awards in the course of his career. A couple which I'd like to mention are the Fulkerson Prize and the IIT Bombay Distinguished Alumnus Award. And uh, Ravi's work has touched upon a broad variety of subjects, ranging from optimization to lattice algorithms, geometry of numbers, algorithms for sampling, clustering, and so on. And the use of geometry and spectral techniques is a recurrent theme in his work. And an excellent resource to learn about all this is the book that he's recently written with Santosh Vempala, or the tutorial which he's about to give. So <laughs> I'll hand it over to Ravi. OK. I guess I don't need this. Thank you very much, uh, um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, give this tutorial and coming early Saturday morning. I do hope the coffee was strong, because I, <laughs> it's a long time since I went to lectures on Saturday, and uh, two hours seems quite a lot, right? Hopefully, there'll be coffee at the one-hour break still, so that you can, you can get a little more caffeine into your system. Um, uh, actually, there used to be lectures at, on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday when I first came to graduate school in the US in the 70s. They stopped this practice, I think. Most universities used to have that. So our analysis class was Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, just like this one. So with that, I launch into uh, uh, the talk. So I wanted to put up, so usually I don't uh, like a slide that says table of contents, but uh, this is some civilized form of table of contents, um, which, is, uh, which I just call the main points. Uh, OK, so here it is. That, that works. So uh, here are the main points. I, I mean, I won't stick to all of these points all the time, but just in general, spectral methods are useful, uh, we want to say, not just for numerical problems, but also for discrete optimization problems. Probably the more traditional uh, numerical analysis uh, field dealt with numerical problems, but now we are finding that combinatorial optimization problems also can use a little bit of spectral analysis. Uh, now, the other point of this talk will be Spectral methods or, uh, can be extended to tensors, but with a qualification. Uh, the theory in algorithms for tensors is not nearly as nice, simple, or clean as for matrices. So linear algebra and matrices is a major accident that things work out really beautifully. And I'll mention some of the things that do work out. But many of these things may or may not extend. Uh, but here, we will like to do some things at least, several, uh, actually the main points of the talk that do extend, and we'll work with and for tensors. So with tensors, that is, we'll have algorithms that do things with tensors just like they do with matrices. And uh, I'm sorry, for tensors, I guess that is. With tensors, there'll be applications 
this doesn't work. But there will be applications uh, um, using tensors for combinatorial problems as well as numerical ones. Again, many things we do not know. One problem you might want to think of is um, optimizing a quadratic form over unit vectors is something we can do using eigenvalue, singular value computations. But optimizing cubic and higher order forms over unit length vectors is interesting. We don't know how to do in general, right? even for cubic forms. Okay. So sampling will play a role in this. Again, in traditional numerical analysis, this is a point of departure. Um, there is not so much work using sampling uh, and linear algebra combined. Perhaps uh, there is starting to be quite a bit now. So sampling will play a prominent role. And it's not just sampling. I put in the phrase sampling on the fly. Uh, I'll tell you what this means as we go along. But roughly, the data is flying by or streaming by, and you would like to sample. Okay. A little more general than streaming, perhaps. So uh, here is a flavor of a very simple sampler I'll mention here at the outset. Uh, this, as well as a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about, is joint work with Alan Fries and Santosh Ampala. So here is a simple way to sample rows or columns of a matrix. Pick a row with probability proportional to its length squared, sum of squares of the entries. And this is a simple distribution. You can more or less do it on the fly. You can more or less compute these probabilities on the fly and perhaps come back and sample them. We'll see there's a lot of mileage you can get out of this simple sampler. So that's a flavor of something that will happen. Um, I, I should say that uh, perhaps you know, the, uh, you'll see a lot of contributions by people in this community, but also by uh, some mathematicians and so on this talk who are not quite in this community. So it'll be nice to bring more of you guys to think about these problems than, than there are already. Now, there are several important topics that I won't cover. Here's one. Uh, spectral graph partitioning, which Dan Spielman had a tutorial on. Uh, these topics are important. I don't cover them because there was already a tutorial uh, by Dan. Uh, I thought about a couple of years ago. Dan reminded me yesterday it was four years ago. But still, that's still available. You can look that up. And also, when I saw the list of invited speakers, um, I noticed that Professor Montanari is on the list. And I was hoping maybe his topic is different. I don't want to prejudge his topic. But I was thinking he might talk a little bit about compressed sensing and related things. So I did not include that uh, uh, line of topic at all in my talk. But these things are important. It's just that I thought there was coverage elsewhere. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll start. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a point of departure from perhaps traditional numerical analysis. Uh, as I said, linear algebra and numerical analysis, things, lots of things are beautiful. Uh, one thing uh, that you all know in the back of your mind, but it's worth recalling, is really that's, uh, in a sense, the granddaddy or whatever, grandmom of all the greedy algorithms that uh, you have in linear algebra. If you want to do spectral decomposition or singular value decomposition, okay, you find an x that maximizes x transpose ax. That's your top eigenvector if it's asymmetric. And you can peel it off and proceed. And this greedy algorithm works. That's at the heart of a lot of min-max theorem and a lot of theory in linear algebra. But that's a very simple little fact to remember that greedy works. You peel off the vector that maximizes this, and you keep going. Okay? Uh, that's very nice, the theory. But you all know that the curse uh, of numerical analysis, not just uh, in applying it, but even in reading it, right? The curse of it, I mean, you have to run through all these expressions with uh, lots of lots of hairy uh, you know uh, things for bounds, and the reason is there are numerical problems, right? So uh, let's see if we can do both of these without the curse, the blessing alone. Um, here's a possible fix. Let me focus on zero one approximating things by zero one vectors x. And in fact, so uh, in this talk, right, I don't want to make it a complete survey, so I want to make a part of it something more detailed. The first part will be more detailed. It's on cut matrices. And uh, the material is enough that I cannot do a sort of tutorial on all of it. So later, I'll start doing survey type things. But on cut matrices, I'll be a little more detailed. So cut matrices are an attempt to capture this blessing by greedily peeling off uh, these quadratic things that maximize quadratic forms. But I want to keep them 0, 1 vectors. I want to keep the x 0, 1 vectors. Okay. And of course, the theory won't be nearly as nice as uh, linear algebra, but it turns out that it serves quite a lot of purposes, algorithmic and existence and algorithm, and in fact, also some applications in graph theory and so on, we'll see. 
So cut matrices. So by the way, I don't like to draw pictures, but I had a friend of mine who was kind enough to draw some of the pictures that you see. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, the talk is, um, I mean, you know, we, uh, it, during the introduction, we saw that a lot of us are from Microsoft. This is not by PowerPoint, by the way. This is a Beamer. Uh, <laughs> they, they all recognize this as a Beamer talk, right? Yeah. Uh, OK, so here is a cut matrix. A cut matrix is just a simple rank one matrix. But before that, a rectangle, yeah, uh, all my matrices will be m by n. And the idea is m and n will be large. Okay? I'll do sampling and so on to control that, but m and n will be large. So a rectangle is just you take a subset of rows, subset of columns. Okay? And a cut matrix is something that has a non-zero, but the same non-zero here is minus 0.7 in each of those positions and zero elsewhere. The reason I call, we call it a cut is you know, if you had a bipartite graph, row vertices and column vertices, this looks like a cut. Right? You take a subset of the row vertices, subset of the column vertices, put all the edges. But they all have the same weight. I mean, a cut would be all weight 1, but you can think of this as all once being weighted by minus 0.7 in this case. Okay? So that's a cut matrix. Uh, again, it's just a rank 1 matrix. But uh, OK, so it's, it's, you can think of it as a 0, 1 vector. Puts 1, 1, 1 here, 0 elsewhere, 1, 1, 1 here. Right. So that x I talked about in the last slide now is a 0, 1 vector is what we wanted to do. So uh, what can we do with cut matrices? OK, the first thing you can ask, uh, I I the traditional algorithm I put up there, well, you can approximate uh, matrices with sums of rank 1. Can you do that? Yes, you can. It turns out you can approximate every matrix by a sum of cut matrices. Not optimally, like you can do about linear algebra, but you can approximate it well enough to do a lot of things. Um, that's the first fact. So this slide is a summary of things that I'll talk about. <coughs> this is very easy. Well, actually, this is one thing I'm going to show you a proof of. Uh, and there's a more general result by uh, uh, Trevisan, Tulsiani, and Vadan, which I'll also uh, mention uh, with proof, sort of. Uh, but I won't prove many things, but this is very simple, so I'll prove that. So you can, in fact, do this peeling off and get an approximation to every matrix. That's existence. Okay. Um, um, it's a bit harder, I mean, it's non-trivial to find these approximations. Now, linear algebra was lucky. You could find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You could solve almost no other nonlinear problem in life. In fact, there's no other non-convex nonlinear problem is solvable in general, essentially. This is going out on a limb a little bit, except for eigenvalues and eigenvectors and singular value, singular vector. This is going out on a limb a little bit, but, but we're really lucky there. But, okay, but it turns out uh, these things can be found, uh, and uh, this requires some work. I will describe this as well uh, in constant time. And in fact, you can do it by sampling with a uh, constant number of entries from the matrix even. Okay? Now, that exploits the zero oneness. Otherwise, sampling is going to run into trouble if the entries are very disparate. Okay? And uh, using the approximation, I mean, so you can. I can do some kind of approximation. What good is it? Well, you can solve lots of things. You can solve all max 2 constraint satisfaction problems. We'll see that. But you suffer an error. If edge weights are 0, 1, you suffer an error of epsilon n squared. Okay. So you can only do it for dense graphs. And, but the nice thing is both the existence and algorithmic version can be extended to tensors. So cut matrices were sub-rectangles. When we go to test tensors, we'll have sub-rectangular solids, right? So uh, the generalization will be very simple. I actually have a 3D picture in a minute. I'll, I'll show you. With this. There's something else my friend drew. So. But it turns out you can use this to solve all maximum R satisfiability problems. I'll later mention what they are. But max 3 sat is a canonical instance of that. Uh, this, again, joint work with Freeze. Um, the main caveat is that the error suffered is uh, uh, only enough to cover dense cases. Now, later in the talk, we'll move away from 0, 1, and then we'll be able to tackle non-dense cases, including some interesting things with satisfy metrics, which are metrics. But not now. Now we'll only stick to these. Okay. So the existence. This is something I promised you a proof, and I'm going to give you a one-slide proof. Um, little bit of notation. Again, I'll not introduce too much notation, so I hope we don't get lost in the notation. But uh, the cut norm of a matrix is the maximum absolute value of any rectangle. So you take rows, columns, sum them up, 
and uh, take the absolute value after summing. Okay, that's the cut norm. I'll have a picture of this in the next slide. By the way, one uh, trouble is it'd be nice to have the text here and a picture there, but I don't know how to do that. So all my pictures follow the slide after after the slide <laughs> has gone away, and uh, maybe that's a bit uh, yeah, that's not optimal. But you know, that's the way it is. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, you, you take uh, all possible rectangles, exponentially, many of them, but take them and take the sum and then take the absolute value. Are you using a Linux program? <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, this is, well, can you do it in, uh, well, well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> my, my graphics is not very good, so we should. Uh, <laughs> so let's assume all entries are at most one in absolute value. Then I'd like to show you, you can approximate existence alone uh, uh, as a sum of these cut matrices. Uh, what, what does the approximation say? I will sum up one over epsilon squared cut matrices. Think of epsilon as constant for this talk, 1% error, right? Um, so you, sometimes when I put in the real constants here, this one is just 1 over epsilon squared. Sometimes it will become odd 1 over epsilon squared, then it's better not to think of epsilon as 1%. Maybe you can think of it as 10%, and then, then it will all work out. But uh, here it's, uh, you know, 1 over epsilon squared is 10 to the 4 or something, but that's a constant. M and N, the size of the matrix is going to infinity. We think of epsilon as a constant. So we pick, we can, we can get a sum of constant number of cut matrices whose sum has the property that differs from A in every rectangle by at most epsilon M N. See, if I didn't have the epsilon here, it's trivial because every entry is at most one. So uh, that's certainly true with B equals zero, but I have the epsilon there. Okay, proof. Uh, as I said, there's one proof I'm going to give you. So um, if already this is true, then we can take B to be 0. So we might as well assume it's not true, which means there is some rectangle which has a large sum, large absolute value sum. And uh, you take the rectangle with the largest sum. This is greedy, just like linear algebra did. This is greedy. Now, how do you find this? That's, a, that's now a big deal. We don't have the accident of linear algebra available to us. So we subtract from each entry of the rectangle the average of the rectangle. So you're peeling this rectangle off in some sense. And that makes progress because if you subtract from a bunch of reals, their mean, then your sum of squares goes down. And since it cannot go down below 0, you have the answer sooner or later, right? Uh, you have to finish this to show how many steps you take, but it turns out this is true. OK, I mean, here's another picture I was able to draw. So, uh, you know, so that's a thing. And you take, it's, a, it's expressed approximately as a sum of, they can overlap, red, yellow, and blue rectangles with some weights on them. Okay. The rectangles themselves would just have all ones there, and then you multiply it by a weight. OK. Um, again, there will be a, oh, this one, yeah, next slide. So this is a bit of a, uh, bit of a heavy slide, but uh, let me try to run through it. Um, so this is an application in graph theory. You, you can get something called the graph regularity lemma. What does the regularity lemma do? First, let's define the density between two subsets of vertices. Density is the number of edges between S and T divided by how many there could be at the max. You could have every edge. So it's a fraction of edges that are there. Now, if I partition the vertex set into K parts, I can look at the density between part I and part J. And I can call the partition regular if for most pairs, vi and vj, every subpart has a density close to the whole. Okay. So actually, what I meant to do, I'll show you this. I meant to um, draw a picture here, but this is, takes too long. So you've got to imagine this uh, picture. <laughs> so, so you can partition the vertex set. And this is Zemeredi's regularity lemma says there is a partition of the vertex set so that between pairs of parts, the subparts have the same density roughly as the whole. Okay? So in other words, the graph doesn't have to uniformly dense everywhere, but you can split up the dense parts and the light parts. And inside light parts, everything will be equally light. Inside dense parts, everything will be equally, light, equally dense, roughly. Right? But you need a tower of height 1 over epsilon to the 20 parts Tim Gow has shown. But what I just said in the previous slide, even though it was very simple, helps you conclude, in fact, that you can get a weaker, version, weaker conclusion with far fewer parts. There is a partition into 1 over epsilon squared, 2 to the 1 over epsilon squared set, so that 
in some global sense, for every ST belonging to every subset of vertices, the number of edges is what you predict from the part densities, from the densities of the parts. Now, uh, this is the expression that you would get if it was exactly regular. This is the density between I and J. This is how much my S has in I. This is how much my T has in J. So this should be the correct answer if uh, the parts behaved completely homogeneously. But this says is approximately correct. Um, that's what I said in red. It's really small. It just means 2 to the 1 over epsilon squared. Uh, this is called the weak regularity lemma. And the original one is a strong regularity lemma. You Oh, sorry, yes. So that, that had, uh, I should have drawn that. So it's a tower of twos. No, no, in terms of what it's. Oh, what's the conclusion? Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, here, uh, Zemerity says it's that most pairs of parts by themselves are epsilon regular. This only uh, asserts that in a global averaging sense. So the error allowed turns out to be more because you're averaging over the whole graph rather than just pairs of parts. Okay. So Zemerity is much stronger, but you need this tower for that. Okay. Um, again, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so here's a, here is a general version of this by Trevisan, Tulsiani, and uh, Vardhan. So their thought was this, right? The main argument in my proof, not in the regularity lemma, in the cut approximation proof, was subtracting the average from a bunch of reals. And that reduces the second moment. We all know that. So if you subtract the average from a bunch of real numbers, the sum of squares goes down. And that's our progress. That is our potential function. Well, this has a random flavor, they observed. And in fact, you can, with the same proof, get the following uh, theorem. Uh, and in, but but you, they get something stronger with a stronger proof. But before we go there, so we have a finite domain. We can think of domain, in this case, as the entries of the matrix. You have a probability distribution over the entries. In our case, for the cut approximation, it was just uniform. And then you have a matrix. Okay. Uh, now, you have a family of bounded function. In our case, that was just the rectangles. Uh, that is, I put ones on the rectangle and zeros elsewhere. That, that was one function for me, right, from the domain x. Uh, but they can allow more general family of functions, any, gen any family of functions. Then the assertion is there are a small number of these functions in the family, like our rectangles, like cut matrices, so that their linear combination here, their linear combination approximates any function g that you can imagine. Or g should be a, excuse me. That g should be a. Okay. So we took a matrix A, approximated a sum of cut matrices. Without going into details, I expect that will be, you don't have to remember all the details. But the point they're making is, this is really more abstract. You, you can have any family of functions, and uh, uh, you can approximate a function reasonably well with a linear combination of the family. Uh, for this, the same proof as I showed you on that slide works, but the theorem is actually more general, which requires a harder proof. I won't, uh, I won't go into that. G was A, I'm sorry. So, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So G was A. So a is, being a is being approximated in the sense that when I take the uh, A's product with anybody, mm -hmm. that's approximated well with the same product, product with the same thing of the linear combination. Right? So that's what they're saying. And as I said, the proof of this is literally the same as what I said. Uh, you're just subtracting the average from a bunch of real numbers. Okay. So, so far, I could get by with just subtracting the average from a bunch of real numbers. Now, I think I should do something more. Um, oh, we have to do some more work uh, to find the thing. So, uh, here's the harder fact. So, we said. Oh, Aij is at most one absolute value again. Now we want to say I can find in polynomial time a matrix, which is the sum. It used to be a one there. It's gone up to four. I can sum. Uh, I can find the sum of four over epsilon squared cut matrices so that I achieve exactly the same conclusion as I had. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 what happens is that in fact it'll turn out that a can be found from just a uniformly at random, UAR is uniformly at random, right? rectangle of constant size. So the subtext here is that all of this will be doable in constant time. And uh, that should probably ring a bell with some of you uh, who know property testing. And I'll come back to that. In fact, it does all that stuff. 
uh, we'll see. So the point of cut approximation is not just for itself. You, you can actually do all these max to a CSP problems using that. So uh, this says that if I, you can do this all with a uniform random sample of constant size. Okay. Now, how do we do it? Well, at the base, uh, I showed you the proof for a reason. The proof showed you that all you really need to do is to implement the greedy. To implement the greedy, we just have to find a rectangle with maximum sum. Right? So uh, here's a simple problem. I give you a matrix. I want you to find a rectangle with maximum absolute value of the sum. Okay? You can throw away the absolute value because you can find the maximum sum, you can find the minimum sum, two problems, right? So uh, think of just uh, find a rectangle with the maximum sum. This is a very simple problem to try to solve. Of course, it's NP hard, but we'll, we'll do something about that, right? So, so th this is the maximum rectangle problem. This is one algorithm I'm going to describe. Again, this one has pictures coming uh, with it. This is one algorithm I'm going to describe somewhat in detail because, in a sense, the themes here will also run through for tenses um, and also will run through for tenses without the 0, 1 assumption. So uh, uh, I want to spend a few minutes, and again, I have pictures of this algorithm, but only on the next slide. Only verbal description here. Okay. So I want to find a subset of rows, subset of columns, so that I get the maximum sum. That's my problem, right? It's NP hard. It's uh, uh, not difficult to show. So take it. First observation, <laughs> if somebody gave you the subset of rows, you can find the subset of columns to go with it, right? It's trivial because if I gave you the subset of rows, yeah, just take the columns where the sum is positive, right? Because uh, we, I want to add up to as high as possible. So as, uh, S gives you T. So only half the problem needs to be solved. Well, it's, it's, a, hard, it's a bad half. Okay. Now, now I, uh, instead of finding, so I want to find the column sums in the S rows, right? So instead, I estimate the column sums in the S rows. Right? Statistical estimate. I do the estimation by picking a random subset of a constant number of rows uniformly at random. Okay? And for each column, I instead of taking the sum in all the S rows, I take the sum in the rows of the sample, which are also in S. Uh, what is S here? Uh, S is the answer. S is the optimal subset of rows. And it's yeah, it's not yet known to the algorithm, right? So uh, if you believe the estimate is reasonable, that's a reasonable thing to do. But I think the question Chris was asking is, in fact, um, we don't actually know S or S. I mean, S is what we are trying to find, okay? And W we know, that's a sample. S is what we are trying to find. We don't know S or S intersect W. But here is a little thing. W is small. It's only one over epsilon squared rows. So we can try every subset of W, call it W curl, as a possible candidate for S intersect W. Okay. We don't know S, but we don't care. We try out all these W curls because there are only two to the one over epsilon squared of them. We, are, we don't worry about simple exponentials, right? Even towers we don't, we don't mind, but simple exponentials certainly we don't mind. So we can try out all subsets of W Pretend each one is S intersect W and try that out. This is exhaustive enumeration. By the way, this uh, exhaustive enumeration, which is a very nice step, I can say that because that's inspired uh, by an idea of Aurora, Karger, and Karpinski um, in the paper which uh, from the 90s on, on um, solving things like the max cut problem with sampling. Okay. okay, so we try all and see where the sum is positive. Now, but we have to still, we don't know S, so we don't know S intersect W. We have to choose the best candidate T. So we have a bunch of T's, right? Each of these gives you a T. How do we choose the best T? Well, we turn the previous argument on its head. That is, we say, if I have a candidate T, T is a subset of columns now, what are the right rows to go with it? Well, that's just that argument reversed. So S prime is a set of rows with positive sum in the T columns, and that's all we need to take. So once I give you a candidate set of columns, I can find out what's the right answer corresponding to that candidate set. And uh, I try all my candidates to take the best. So, so the first step can be viewed as a reduction from n by m matrix 
matrices to n by 1 over epsilon squared size matrices? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's right. And then you turn it around. And then turn it around on its head and observe that, you know, you really only need this. Okay. So it's very simple, except to make sure the error is not too much. The error is a little complex, but yeah, so otherwise it's yeah, quite simple. Ah, <laughs> now come the pictures. The maximum, okay, good. So this will take us a little bit of time. So uh, S is the green rows. So suppose S was the, I, I don't know whether S is the correct answer. Somebody might quickly calculate and say, oh, <laughs> I, I, please don't do that. But <laughs> as long as you don't do that, this is. So if that, if that was the correct S, then I claim this is the correct T because, you know, uh, I, I, in this column, the sum in the S rows is 1.7 minus 1 is 0.7, and that's positive. These three are positive. Those are negative sum in the S rows, sum in the green rows. You can check. So the only the first three make up your T. Okay. Now I pick a sample W. W is the yellow sample. Now usually sample is much smaller size, but of course in this picture, sample is also of size 3. These three yellow things, right? Uh, and now I would have taken S intersect W, that is these two rows, and seeing which columns are positive sum in that. And of course, I'll make some errors. So the purple, right? This column and this column, as well as this column, have a positive sum in S intersect W, that is this and this. Okay. So we got a false positive, right? That was not positive on the whole of S, but it's positive in the sample. We got a false negative that should have been N, but it's not N. It didn't come up. So we'll get some errors both ways. Okay. Um, now, why does the algorithm work intuitively without giving you a proof? The proof is a little complicated. Um, uh, not too bad, but it's a little complicated. So why does it work? So notice that I made a mistake on this column. Should have been in, but I omitted it. But notice that the sum in the S rows is not too, too high. It's only 0.1. Now, of course, I made up this example, but it's only point. <laughs> so it's likely that the mistakes are close to zero, right? Because if, if the column sum is very far away from zero, that will show up in the sample, you hope. So the ones that don't show up in the sample must be very close to zero. And con the other, other direction also is similar. So hopefully, you only made mistakes on the small things. In fact, something like that is true. That's, that's how the proof goes. Now, I want to uh, spend a couple of slides spending this, uh, making this constant time before that. This is simple because I'm just recapping the algorithm. Uh, we had a constant number of sets which were small. For each set, we found the set of columns with positive sum. And for each such t, t is a set of columns, we found the set of rows with positive sum in them. And then the largest of these is our answer. Okay. So I want to make this all work with a sample in constant time. So. Uh, so I'm going to add only the red stuff. So I, I now don't have the whole matrix. I've thrown away the whole matrix. I only picked a sample. It turns out I need 1 over epsilon to the four rows and columns. But it doesn't matter. Constant number of rows and columns. I only have that. And I'm going to do the whole algorithm only based on that, having thrown away the whole matrix. Now, why is it that I can do that? Um, now, the first step for each W tilde, W tilde was a small set. You had to find the sample of columns with positive sum. But instead of taking <coughs> all the columns and seeing which have positive sum, I take only the ones in the sample and take which have positive sum. Okay. And uh, so I take only the sample columns. And here, for each t, I must take all the rows that are positive sum. Inside, only take the sample rows. Okay. So this uh, modification, by the way, seems mostly just syntactic, but it requires some sweat to actually prove this. But in, in, as I present this talk, as I present the slide, it's all just these red words that have been added. So just adding a few red, uh, just yeah, to summarize, just adding a few red words, you're done, right? So you can do the whole thing with sampling. Uh, there are some details, but. Uh. So what's the end of the day, what do you get? So at the end of the day, we get an implicit approximation as a sum of cut matrices. Okay. Now, uh, this whole process is repeated a constant number of times to find the whole approximation. All of this was to find the maximum rectangle problem. You peeled it off and you... What's the quality of the approximation? Yes, okay. The quality was what was stated in the theorem. That is, in every rectangle of the difference, the sum is at most epsilon mn. Okay. Okay. 
by the way, it can be shown. These things are the best. Uh, I'll later uh, give you a reference for that. But uh, there are lower bounds matching these. You can't do much better than that. Okay. So in the cut approximation, you repeated this several times, right? But we keep track of all of them on the way. And at the end of the day, what you get is this. For a particular entry of the matrix, for a particular ij, if I presented ij to you and ask you what the approximate entry there is, you can tell me that in constant time for each entry from the approximation Okay, at the end of this. OK, so let's step back one step. In the beginning, I said, uh, in numerical analysis, we use non zero one, but we wanted to use zero one for combinatorial things. Why use this particular thing? Here's a very simple illustration of why the cut is actually useful. Cut norm is useful. Okay. So let's solve the uh, max cut problem. By the way, it turns out what I say here applies to all max two CSP problems, but I'll only do the max cut here. So the max cut, you have, uh, let's say, A is the adjacency matrix of the graph, and you want to find x, you want to maximize x transpose A one minus x. Right, where x is a zero one vector, x tells you whether i is an s or s bar. Right? You can see that you get uh, x i one minus x j a i j. So if i and j are an s and s bars, then you get a contribution. Otherwise, not. Right. So x transpose a x is just the sum of the entries of some rectangle. So you take the s rows and s bar columns to sum them. It is a rectangle. Okay. And that's why the cut approximation is a useful norm, because in every rectangle then shows we get the sum more or less right. And that's really exactly what you want for the max cut, right? Well, it's more than what you want, because max cut is particular types of rectangles, but this does it for all rectangles. Okay. So <laughs> if I had A and B whose cut norm were close in this norm, then the max cut solutions will be the same, will be, will be, will be close, excuse me. So instead of solving the A problem, I can solve the B problem. Okay. I can put B i j as edge weights rather than A i j and solve it. What good is that? Well, B is a low rank matrix. It's a sum of a small number of uh, matrices. So uh, that will make our life easier, as we'll see. So cut norm is natural for ensuring uh, that, um, that uh, the max cut is roughly the same. But now in x transpose b 1 minus x, to evaluate that, okay, since b is of rank constant, there are only constant number of variables, really. Okay? There aren't n variables, right? You need to only worry about the dot product of x with each uh, thing that spans the space of b. Okay? So if b is uh, rank k, it should be a k-dimensional problem. Okay? Now here I, don't, I skip all the details, but that's very simple. So uh, technically hairy, but it's, it's very simple. So really what we've done by this process is reduced an n variable problem to a constant number of variables. And then we can go solve it in exponential time in the constant number of variables. Ah, this is now uh, uh, a slide explaining that it works for tensors. So I will draw a three-dimensional tensor. So the same algorithm, same decomposition, essentially everything the same works for higher dimensional uh, tensors, except for one twist, and I'll describe that. So uh, uh, I want to find STU. Excuse me, I should have put that. STU is a rectangle, and I want to, it's a rectangular solid. I want to find the maximum sum in a rectangular solid. Okay. And again, we observe that if I give you S and T, U is very simple, things that, uh, that have the positive sum. That's U. Um, so I think this is an attempt. Ah, this is an attempt to give you S and T. So uh, this is the set of rows S I give you. This is the set of columns T I give you, right? The blue or the T's and the um, maroon or the S's. And I want to know if that that particular K, each uh, level is a K. That's a K. I want to know if the K is n, and I just check if this is positive, and if this is positive. Uh, then it's in. That is, I take these entries on the kth cut and see if they sum up to positive or not. Okay, good. Now, uh, again, we don't know S and T at all. If you knew, then we would know U, but we don't know anything. But we pick a sample of rows, sample of columns, okay, and just take, instead of summing over all of them, just take in the sample and see if it's positive. 
you don't have to follow the details, but in the abstract, what this gives you is a subset of slabs, right? So it gives you a candidate subset of slabs. Now you get many candidate subsets of slabs, and you have to check which one gives you the maximum. But that's a two-dimensional problem, right? So if I give you which slab is in, I, I give you this slab is in, this is in, this is in, perhaps, then I can squish that axis and check uh, uh, solve a two-dimensional problem. So in general, if it was an R tensor, I would have to solve an R minus one tensor problem. Okay, so that, without more details, is is it? Um, okay, so I should uh, tell you this connection to. Uh, um, let's see, we started little late, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So okay. Um, uh, so max R C S P. So. Here, think of this typical, if you're not immediately familiar with it, think of the typical problem as max 3 sat. I have Boolean satisfiability with three literals per class. I want to satisfy as many as possible. Here's the theorem, which uh, this is joined with um, Noga, Lone, De La Vega, and Karpinski. It says that, it's a very simply stated theorem. It says that I have any Boolean formula, uh, R is fixed, arity, 3 sat, 4 sat. If I pick uniformly at random a subset of variables, constant number of variables, and I take the induced problem. The induced problem means I take only clauses involving just those variables. It's like an induced graph. Induced graph, if you pick some vertices, I take only those vertices and I just incident both ends there. So my entire class has to belong to the sample. When I take that and solve it, that's constant that can be solved then the answer is a good estimate of the answer of the whole thing. Okay. Now, there is a scaling factor, which is the right scaling factor, because you know I picked Q variables out of R, so I have to, and, and the arity is R, so I have to scale by this. But subject to that scaling, the uh, induced subproblem gives you the right answer. Okay. Now, I don't know a very simple proof of this, by the way. This, this involves all this machinery of uh, 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 decomposing by cuts and some more. I will mention some more machinery, which is perhaps independently interesting in the next slide. But uh, it would be nice to prove this uh, with uh, a simple proof. I mean, the theorem is innocuous sounding, uh, but seems to require this. So uh, OK, so the uh, moral of the story is you can find the value, certainly from this in constant time, but you can also find a satisfying assignment. That's a little more difficult. So I should say that. Uh, Clearly, you know, if you're familiar with property testing, so uh, Anderson and Engelbretson, uh, independent of this, independent of us, our stuff involves all this cut approximation on linear algebra, but they proved the same result, a little uh, higher sample complexity, but it's stronger in some other respects. Uh, and their methods were using methods of property testing, and property testing, as you probably many of, most of you are aware, Gold was our Gold Rush and Ron started that. And they were the first constant time algorithms Generally, property testing tackled max to a CSP. I mean, this one used methods to tackle max or CSP. But their arguments, somehow these two streams is interesting. Uh, these arguments that I'm giving you here are linear algebraic, basically. But the other uh, line, the arguments are generally combinatorial. OK, so buried in this, we have to solve two problems that are independently interesting, and I want to put them up. And this is to do with random induced subproblems. So uh, I'm not aware of too much work on this, but here's the situation, right? Uh, I want to solve an optimization problem on a big object. I randomly sample a small object out of it and solve the optimization problem on the small object, on the induced object. And I want to say this answer gives me an estimate of the whole. Okay? So here are two situations where that's true. Those are to be proved along the way. So uh, here's one, linear programming. So so uh, that was a recap I already did. So linear programming. So I have bounded linear program. It's very important. The x, y's are between 0 and 1. I have some inequalities. And let's say that's a huge linear program that I uh, would, li would like to solve. Here's the result. If I pick uniformly at random a subset of q variables, q um, is constant. Think of it as like the last slide. Okay. And I let a q, x q be only the q columns. That's an induced subproblem. I take uh, a, a subset of variables and only those columns. And I solve the LP on those, but I have to allow a little swap. 
because sampling is not going to give you exact answers always, right? So I'm going to relax the constraints a little bit. Um, or oh, excuse me, there should be a scale factor here, which I forgot, okay, because of the Q. But um, it's Q over N, because you have something only Q out of N variables. But in any case, you solve the LP on the, the random induced subproblem, and the first easy part says that the big LP was feasible, then the uh, sampled LP is feasible. Okay? Now, that's not difficult. Um, why is that? If the big LP is feasible, there's a feasible solution out there. You take the same solution restricted to the sample variables. It gave you values for the sample variables. Plug that in, you should more or less have it. Right? That's just the sampling amount. The slightly harder part, and it turns out even this is quite easy for linear programming, the slightly harder part is if the big thing is infeasible, that thing is infeasible, then so is the small thing. Okay. And I'll have a picture later to explain why this is not trivial. But this so is. Has been reversed. Sorry? That's been reversed intentionally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. I'm glad you got it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. If it was just feasible or just infeasible, see, there's no free lunch, right? Sampling is not going to, well, there might be at the end of this talk, but <laughs> no, not, not during the talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, yeah, so the sampling is not going to get you uh, uh, the correct answer when it's very close. Yeah? Do you think some kind of uniformity condition Right. So the deltas hide some factors depending on A entries, yes. So if some of the so two things I should mention. If some of the entries are a, a were very big, or if the X's were not bounded, then you would be in trouble. See if the X's are not bounded, uniform sampling shouldn't do. Right? Because we are picking each variable uniformly. That shouldn't work. And in fact, you know, you need more work if the X's Okay. So here's a harder problem, another random induced sub problem, uh, which also was needed. So now you have a tensor with entries between minus one and plus one. And you pick uniformly at random a subset of 1 over epsilon to the 4. Now, uh, it's symmetric, the rows and columns. It's like a graph, right? Uh, or on the same, in, same uh, set. You pick a subset of that n and take the induced submatrix, right? Same rows and columns and so on. Take the induced submatrix. And then the theorem asserts that the cut norm of this, so I take every rectangle here, sum it up, take the max. That's, in fact, at most what you expect, correct scaling factor times the cut norm of this plus error. Okay. This I'll have a picture that will explain better next slide. So uh, this is like the harder part of the LP, uh, LP thing. So it says that So the much easier part would have been, suppose I had a rectangle with a large sum. Suppose there's a rectangle R with a large absolute value sum in the whole matrix. Then there is one in the sample too just the image of the whole thing. I mean, I'm sampling. I have a rectangle summing to a high thing. Throw away everything else, just a rectangle. The sample must reflect that rectangle, must have an estimate. So uh, if this is high, this is high. That's the inequality going the wrong way. That's easier, right? The converse is what we are asserting here, which is a bit harder. So the converse says if most small submatrices have large sum rectangles, then so does the whole matrix. And this needs the wapnik chevalenkis dimension type. Uh, if you remember, I mean, again, I won't go through the proof of this. So it requires a doubling, double sampling argument that we had in our paper. Uh, and this was improved by Rudelson version. And for the matrix case, 1 over epsilon to the 4 was knocked down to 1 over epsilon squared. But that required quite a bit of machinery from functional analysis. And uh, in general, there's a question, can we assert something strong when we draw a sample? In so. All these assertions are very small samples. What you'd like to do in practice, whether it's linear programming or uh, any of these graph problems or satisfiability, you'd like to say the following, uh, that I pick 100 of the variables and look at the problem and solve it, and I get something sensible. Because, I mean, now I'm doing it much faster. These arguments will not do you that, uh, it will not work in that range, because for just getting an error of epsilon, we need one over epsilon squared samples. So certainly they do you no good beyond root n. And we need sort of new arguments for that, and that would really connect up with practice. Okay. This should count as sort of general musing. I don't think I have particular ideas to solve that. Ah, here's a nice picture. <laughs> yeah, this is what I've been waiting to show you. So I, this is the, um, the cut matrix uh, term, sorry, the last term, but stated for max cut. 
instead of cut norm because I can draw this nice picture. So here's the max cut statement. The max cut statement says, I have a big graph and I want to estimate how big a max cut is there. And the theorem would say, I pick random subsets, each egg is a random subset, okay, and take the max cut value in those and that's a good estimate. The harder part of this, the harder of the two parts of this theorem is, suppose most random samples have good cuts. Then I would like to assert the big graph has a good cut. Okay? And uh, you know, for good reason, that's called the Humpty Dumpty problem because you know, uh, if uh, you don't know, we don't know which is S, which is S bar in the whole graph because this element, for instance, is an S bar element when I do this sample and it is an S element in that sample. So you don't know which parts to put into S and which into S bar in the whole graph. The proof is via these cut approximations. I mean, there is uh, possibly a, a purely combinatorial proof, uh, but I don't know it. There is a, the proof we have is along these cut approximation things. So hopefully, at least the sense of the theorem is clear. So this is true that for the max cut, this is true that if samples had good max cuts, large max cuts, so does the whole graph. Okay. Now, one of the uh, nice corollaries of um, of uh, uh, these induced subproblems, as well as cut decomposition, is uh, a, a sequence of results. I'll, I'll uh, mention this. I'm not able to give you all the details, but I hope I, this will make sense. So, by Bogues, Chase, Lovas, and so. Uh, <coughs> they consider the following question. How does one define the limit of a sequence of graphs? The nth of the uh, sequence, nth graph in the sequence is on n vertices. So graphs are getting larger and larger. How do you define the limit? Uh, perhaps the uh, model of that is what happens when the web graph gets larger and larger. Okay. So I, I, I'm not going to dwell on that, but, but just that's just the motivation. Okay. Now, to, to define limits, you need, a, you need a notion of distance, right? So if a sequence is Cauchy, you say it has a limit, but you need a distance, of, need a notion of distance. So we need a notion of distance between graphs, but you need a notion which, which works for graphs with different numbers of vertices. Now one intuition that goes into the result is a graph regularity lemma, which I described a little bit earlier. It partitioned the vertex set into a small constant number of parts so that the part the vertex is in told its story. This is uh, abbreviated version of what I said quantitatively earlier. So here's an intuition. Suppose we pick randomly sufficiently many vertices from the graph. The sample, the induced graph, will tell us the partition and therefore tell us the whole story. Okay. So suppose you believe all this. There's still a new twist, which is, which is a little bit bad, which, which, which is a little bit um, uh, uh, something we have to tackle. And that is that we have not told the labeling on the set of vertices. So I give you an n node graph, 10 node graph, 20 node graph, million node graph, and so on. But I don't tell you which node is labeled what. Now, all this cut decomposition stuff I told you, it depends on the row. And if I permute the rows and columns, I change the whole thing, right? But in this picture, I should be allowed to permute the rows and columns because graph labels are not, the particular labels are not important. So these thoughts plus the random induced submatrix theorem that I told you earlier. Um, lead them to this theorem that they prove, which I'll state now without having given you all the details. Uh, so if you have a graph and two parameters, error parameters, you take an induced subgraph on a subset of this many vertices, that in fact more or less represents the graph. Is epsilon close to G with probability at least one minus delta? Therefore, if you have a family of graphs, it has a limit if and only if a random induced subgraphs are the same or are close, right? This, this thing represents the whole graph. So if you want to have a limit, after a while, everybody must get close to one graph, and that's this one. Roughly speaking, that's the gist of the theorem. Musing, I mean, I put several things in amusing, which means don't pay attention is some random, uh, random thought. But uh, I don't know whether it's interesting, but what, nobody has considered uh, sequences of matrices and tensors and whether they have limits. And, uh, but of course, for the graph theory, we have a story in terms of the web. I don't know whether uh, matrices should get larger and larger in the real world. Maybe they should. And then we should look at the limit. Um, let's see. So um, I, should, I think this is also in the 
belongs in the first part. So, okay, so uh, the algorithmic question, uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> maximum rectangle problem, the simple problem again, right? I give you a matrix, I want to find the maximum absolute value of sum of a rectangle. Alone and Novo, I mean, it's, it's easy to show that it's NP hot. Alone and Novo gave a constant factor approximation algorithm for this. Uh, now, uh, the, the way they did it was an STP reform, SPT, STP relaxation of it. So the problem itself was to find a 0, 1 vector. We can reformulate it as a plus minus 1 vector. It's a little bit, e little bit nicer. So I want a plus minus 1 vector x and a plus minus 1 vector y so that x i, x a transpose y is maximized. You can now relax it where instead of plus minus 1 they become vectors, right? And this is the dot product. And there is something called, uh, there's an old term of growth and decay that says that the optimal values are within constant factors. But what's needed, and they did that work, is to get an algorithm out of it which actually finds a solution. Okay. Now, uh, this is one of several things. Uh, the, uh, uh, also, I mentioned some results of Rudel's inversion where you use function analysis. These are things that do not extend automatically to tensors. So, for example, I know almost nothing about the following problem. I've given a three-dimensional tensor. I want to find the rectangle, rectangular solid with the maximum sum. Okay. Can you get a constant factor approximation? I mean, we can get our algorithms to work, but they have an additive error. Okay. Constant factor approximation, we don't know. Okay, that I think is part one. This is part two. Uh, so we, 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 we take a break, and I hope the coffee is still there and strong. And uh, we'll come back in. Five minutes. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> oh, you're working in the mic. Can I do this? No, no, I have to go in the. Well, I hope this is all.
I guess I should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So welcome to part two. Now we can really tell how strong the coffee was. But, uh, but uh, this part, so the first part was all about uniform sampling and what you can do. And uh, as you can guess, it's not everything that you can do with uniform sampling. Although, you know, uh, like before uh, this stuff was developed, uh, if you take property testing or any of these things, perhaps, perhaps that's more than one might have expected from uniform sampling. But anyway, there are limits to it. Uh, <coughs> So what we did, uh, so the, that's the title of the second part, repeated twice. But what we did was, uh, again, uniform sampling. We found approximations by cut matrices, and then we solved max R CSPs to add it to where epsilon n to the R, or the additive. But this only solves dense problems. Um, now, cut matrices are combinatorial rank one matrices. They're ideally suited for uniform sampling. So the point is this, right? If you have a vector that doesn't have zero one components. Some component could be very big, some could be very small. At least intuitively, uniform sampling is not going to do you good in general. So you've got to hit the big component. And that's the trouble we've run into. Uh, now, the one nice thing about uniform sampling, besides all, all the other stuff, is that uh, sampling on the fly, uniform sampling can be done on streaming matrices. So uh, you don't even have to see the matrix. You can toss coins beforehand and decide I'm going to pick the 10, 15th, 120th entry, and so on. And then when the matrix streams, you can pick out those entries, right? Uh, because it's uniform. Now, if you want adaptive sampling, which depends on the entries themselves, you cannot do this uh, in a streaming fashion in general. But that's the kind of thing we'll be doing for uh, the second part of the talk. Um, now we can just check your mic. I'm not sure. Oh, mic is not No, you're right. Never turned it on. Oh, is it on now? Yeah. No. It's, oh, now it's green. It should be on. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm loud enough. That it's, it's, yeah. it's for the video. Yeah. Oh, it's for the video. Yeah, not it's for the video. <laughs> so now we want the general low rank approximation. So we are going to revert more or less to a traditional linear algebra kind of terms, right? So, uh, but I want to do it for tensors as well. So for, for this talk, uh, rank one matrix or tensor is just the outer product of vectors. So just for uh, 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 a matrix or outer product of two vectors, 
is just a matrix whose i gate entry is ui times vj. Right? You have three vectors, it's ui times vj times wk. And for this talk, the reason I say for this talk is there are lots of different ways of doing this, but for this talk, a matrix of tensors of rank at most k is at the sum of k rank 1 matrices of tensors. It's a minimum number so that you can express it as a sum of so many rank one matrices of tensors. You won't worry about finding them yet, just by. Now it turns out the simple one slide proof I showed you carries over more or less verbatim to prove this for tensors. It's a very simple fact. Uh, for every matrix, every tensor A, there is a rank one over epsilon squared approximation B with the following property. I take the difference between A and B and take the two norm of that. That's at most epsilon times the Frobenius norm of that. So I'll tell you these terms in a minute here. So the two norm means the max over all i, j, k, I'm sorry, max over all x, y, z of this cubic form sum. But the x, y, z, etc. have to be unit length vectors. Just like quadrat for quadratic form, this is the top singular value. This is the operator, right? the spectral norm. Uh, and A sub F is the square root of the sum of squares of all the x's. So X and Y's are now real vectors. X and now are real vectors, right, of length one. So it's important that I cannot change either the 2 or the F to the other thing, and that doesn't work. Simple example show you that. That is, the thing to remember is the 2 norm, which is usually smaller than the Frobenius number, the 2 norm is all we can bound. And we can only bound that as epsilon times the Frobenius norm on this side. So it would, it's not, it, it would be much stronger to put Frobenius norm there or two norm there if we count it. However, the, uh, the good part of the story is that this is sufficient to do a bunch of things. It's sufficient to do what's called principal component analysis. It's sufficient also to do much more general versions of max CSP problems. So comment or problems. We'll see that. Okay. So, uh, these are somewhat verbal slides, so I, th I guess many or most of you know uh, principal component analysis, uh, but here's a one slide explanation of it, right, uh, with sweeping a lot of things under the rug. In fact, principal component analysis anyway sweeps a lot of things under the rug. It only, it only displays a constant number of things. Right? So uh, usually you have an M by N matrix of data, very big matrix. Let's say customer product matrix. M is the number of customers, N is the number of products. We we hypothesize that there's a small number k of basic factors like income, age, etc., cetera, uh, that influence how much each customer buys of each product. You don't know these factors, right, beforehand. And, uh, but the factors are unknown, but the top k singular vectors you hypothesize will correspond to the top k factors. Okay, very good. But let's go back to, let's go back to this error bound. Why does that work for such things, right? Um, why does the 2 there and the F there still work for such things? Here is an intuitive story. Another example is a document term matrix, uh, which is used a lot. And the rows are documents, the columns are terms, and AIJ tells you how many times that term occurs in the document. Or perhaps a modulated, some function of the number of times it occurs, right? Okay. Now, for a new document V, you often define its similarity to existing documents by just dot products. So documents are just vectors. That tells you how many times each term occurred. And similarity is often defined as a dot product between those two vectors, right? And so AV is the, ve is the vector of all similarities with existing documents. And the important thing about using two norm is that if the two norm, if you approximate A by a B and the two norm is less than delta, then we get that the similarity vector is very close, right? By definition. Okay? So it is the two norm that you are concerned with, not the Frobenius norm in general. You're not concerned with how much error you make globally on all uh, documents, but just on one particular one you're given at a time. And um, uh, the same uh, two norm works for discrete optimization. And we already saw, I didn't relate this two norm to the cut norm, but they are similar things. That's all I'll tell you. I won't relate them exactly. Um, we saw for max cut, if a matrix is replaced by B, where the cut norm, now the cut norm is an operator norm. Uh, with an, a small factor that uh, we won't go into in detail, but roughly the cut norm is also like the maximum over all vectors of some quantity. Okay? That's not difficult to see. 
So uh, we saw that, and in fact, we'll see more applications of this. Okay. This is just a story to tell you that this is the right error bound. See, actually, the point is that this is all we can do. This is the story telling you that's okay. But anyway, it's always okay to do what you can do that falls out. Okay, so now uh, the question you can ask is, can you find these, right? That's, that's uh, otherwise it's not useful. So uh, this is joint work with De La Vega, Karpinski, and Vempala. So we showed that uh, for any A and epsilon, we can in fact find a tensor B of rank at most 4 over epsilon squared. So uh, it was 1, got replaced by a 4 again. Uh, in time, which is exponential in epsilon, but not in N, right? So it works in polynomial time for constant epsilon such that with high probability you have the error bounds that you want to, right? A minus B2 norm is at most epsilon times the Frobenius norm of F. Okay. Now, the proof of the existence was just that peeling off, the greedy peeling off, right? That there was a one proof of existence. We had the same proof carries over. So from that proof we see that to implement this, all we have to do is the greedy. So we have to find x, y, z, if it's a three tensor, maximizing <coughs> the uh, maximizing this thing. I should have said a minus b two, or sorry, maximizing this thing. Excuse me, maximizing two with an epsilon Frobenius norm of f this quantity, the cubic form, right, over unit vectors. Okay. Now uh, this exact problem, I actually don't know the precise data. I think it's true that Santosh Vampala and a student have shown that for four and higher tensors, this is NP hard, but for cubics, I think it's not known. Even the exact problem, for all we know, I think can be can be done. We don't know, but four and higher, I think it's NP hard. It's NP hard even for three. Okay, so even for three, it's NP hard. We'll there is a big okay. Yeah, so I, yeah, so so it's NP hard to do the exact problem, right? Uh, so here we want to do with this approximation. So we'll describe the algorithm later after we see an a same sort of sampling idea in a more simple setup. Okay. So in general, I said here that not much is known about maximizing cubic and higher order forms. Quadratic forms, of course, are doable again by linear algebra. This, I keep reminding of that linear algebra by a lot of uh, nice, beautiful theory, but we don't have such luck for cubics. Okay, so what if we have this? What can we do? A brief slide, and then we'll try to start doing it. Okay. So we have this. So we saw already that um, uh, max of CSPs can be solved. Now it turns out this. I won't go into detail. I'll just mention it. If you had this approximation, then uh, of course you can do PCA. But in addition, there are more general approximations will help us solve max max of CSP in more general situations, including ones where you have metrics. So um, here's a condition which is a common generalization of a metric and a dense graph. Metric means triangle inequality, right? And dense. So uh, if the weight of each edge, right, if you think of it as a graph, must be at most C over n, the total weight at the vertex, the two ends, and the total average uh, weight in center vertex. So that's just saying that no edge is very wildly high, the edge weight. The edge weight is at most the average of all the edges incident to one of its endpoints or an average vertex. This is a common general. Triangle inequality satisfies. It's not very difficult to show. In fact, more general things than metric, even powers of metrics or roots of metrics satisfy this kind of condition. And then for all those graphs, you can find max cut and max to the CSP. Also, you can do max of CSP for things that satisfy that once you have that. Okay. I, I won't tell you how, it, but uh, we'll focus on getting that from now on. So here is something uh, tangential, right? It's nice uh, to say something tangential, I guess. So, uh, so here's a question, right? Uh, the the one objection, uh, for example, I I, uh, I had this result about graph limits. You can say that some of these results only work for dense graphs. Certainly, all the results that I stated in the first part only work for dense graphs. And maybe dense graphs are not the most interesting class. Very large graphs that you see, of course, are very sparse, naturally occurring graphs. So. Now, here is a, a possible hypothesis about naturally occurring graphs. There are lots of nice models, generative models. That's not where I want to go for the moment. We want to say perhaps naturally occurring graphs like the web graph, or even though they are large, they're computationally easy. I don't know what that exactly means. Perhaps it's easy to solve max cut problems in that. 
I don't know, do you want to solve max set problems in web graph? Maybe you don't, but, but there are other problems that you may want to solve. Maybe it's true that these very large graphs have low complexity in terms of being able to solve things. Now we want to do this without assuming a generator model uh, and uh, the question is perhaps some of these some of these generalizations maybe not this one maybe something else fits this picture I don't know again I'm going out on a limb there I don't have specific ideas actually I think I tried uh, I don't know the status of that you can ask if you have a power law degree distribution is it true that it satisfies some of those conditions I think the answer is no but uh, 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 you have to modify the conditions at least to make this work. Okay, good. Now, now we are on solid ground, right? So I'm going to do matrix multiplication. That I know how to do very well. So here I'm going to show you how sampling helps in this simple example. By the way, the subtitle of this is uh, what's the simplest paper you've got into Fox? And this, is, this is joint work with my student Petros Renaya. So I'll put it up later. And some of the very simple paper on matrix multiplication. But idea was used to sample, right? using sampling. So I want to multiply two matrices A and B. Y you may have observed this. I mean, I actually hadn't observed this. A little fact you can check that the product is just the sum over all columns of A of the jth column of A out of product of the jth row of B. It's not a big deal. It's, you know, I, I, I just didn't know this till a few years back, but maybe all of you know that. So here's the idea. This is the sum. You don't want to, let's say that you want to do it fast, so don't find the whole sum. Estimate it. So draw a sample of S of the J's and estimate the sum over these S J's, right? And that's your estimate of the whole thing. You have to um, normalize it a little bit so that you get an unbiased estimator. That's very simple to figure out. So the correct scaling is the estimate I want to return is the sum over S sample J's of this quantity. One over S certainly, right, because I'm taking S samples. And this is the right scaling. Probability of picking J divides that outer product because then the expectation is right, that's all. It's unbiased, right? So the expectation is correct. And of course, uh, again, I said it's very simple, but it still goes beyond expectation, but not very far. And that is, it goes to variance, right? So you, you have to worry about the variance of the estimate. But the variance is different for each entry. Now, how do we bound the variance? So here is a, oh, I see. Now, here's a picture of it before we bound the variance. So we just, uh, we want to multiply A and B. A and B are big fat matrices. And you get a tall, thin, and um, this kind of matrix. But the same rows, right? Same rows as the columns. Important. OK. Controlling the variance. Consider the important case when B equals A transpose. So you just want to multiply A and A transpose. Um, uh, there's actually an older paper of Edith Cohen and uh, I forgot the co-author's name. But Edith, but Edith Cohen, which, does, which did this using a different sampling procedure. Um, OK, again, A, A transpose is just the sum over all j of the jth column out of product jth row. Nothing there. So what are the probabilities with which you must pick the columns? Suppose I tell you, you can choose any probability with which you pick the jth column. They just have to be sum to 1, and they have to be non-negative. No quantum, right? They're all non-negative, and they sum to 1. So uh, what's the best choice of probabilities? Well, it turns out that probabilities proportional to the squared length of the columns is the correct choice that minimizes the variance. It takes only a few lines of calculus to show that. Now, we, you, you, it's very easy to work out. So, so uh, that introduces, that brings me to the topic of length squared sampling. So again, I mentioned in the first slide. So here's a very simple procedure to sample rows or columns of a matrix. Pick a row or column in probability proportional to the squared length. Okay. That minimizes the variance here it can show. Also, it was introduced with Alan Fries and this. This paper for matrix multiplication with, with a former, uh, I kept calling him a student, but he's a former student of mine, Petros Renayas, who's long graduated and he's a completely grown up person now. So, uh, so this length squared sampling has many uses. We'll see some more of them, but it works for matrix multiplication. Okay. Now, in, uh, uh, in uniform sampling, I could, I could do streaming, right? I could just stream the data. Now, here is questionable whether you can do streaming and still draw the sample according to length squared. With a little bit of sweat, if you're given the matrix in row order, you can sample rows in streaming. But we really would like to sample rows as well as columns. So that we cannot do in streaming. Okay. And we want to tackle matrices that are given in any order. We don't want to worry about the order. But it, it's simple to see that in two passes, I can draw a sample. Pass one, I compute all the row length squared and keep them. And pass two, 
I know the probabilities and pick rows or columns according to that, right. Two passes I can do sampling according to length squared. Okay. Now um, in fact uh, you know streaming is a model where the data is so big that you cannot even store it. But there is an intermediate model where perhaps the data is big but it can be stored. I mean storage device is also very big. So perhaps you can store it and look at it once, twice, thrice but you can't look at it many times and it is not random access. So the model in which you can make multiple passes but you have to be really careful about making multiple passes. Uh, it's a it's a costly resource that's interesting in that model you can do this in two passes. I, I won't say much more about the thing okay so here it is right. So um, so here's an example of matrix multiplication that uh, actually is more or less proves the theorem right. So here's a here's a matrix I want to find AA transpose right. I pick one sample column and uh, the length squared of this is 3.75 and the length squared of the whole thing is 8.44 right. So you pick uh, the first column with probability 3.75 over 8.44. Once you picked it I am picking only one sample one column right. I could have picked multiple columns but I am picking only one, only one. Once you picked it you this is the right scaling the scaling is by the reverse of the probability. I mean that is not very difficult to see that is very low probability columns if picked or weighted very highly that is just to make it unbiased and then the proof that this method works is uh, you know you see that the entry is approximately I mean we get the 1 1 entry of AA transpose sort of correctly right by this. Okay. Now uh, I, I said I mean there is a lot of stuff said about pictures and uh, uh, this thing so you know there is um, some people draw a lot of pictures in the talk so sometimes they sit in talks and say oh my god it will be nice to draw all those pictures I am partly jealous of uh, people who are able to spend a little bit of time drawing all the pictures but partly I am sitting in talks sometimes for every equation the left hand side marches in from the left and the right hand side marches in from the right and they clash on the equation and I say what does that give me right and, and uh, that made me ask the following question right. I mean that is what you usually get the converse you know sometimes is not true you should not draw too many pictures just I mean I know, I know it takes too much time anyway. So. <laughs> Okay, lower rank approximation. Uh, okay, this is uh, uh, just sort of writing out what I said. Uh, epsilon times the Frobenius norm squared. That's the uh, accuracy you get out of picking poly in one over epsilon rows and columns. Should have said. Yeah. So all the errors are epsilon times Frobenius norm squared. So here was our length squared sampling algorithm you pick S columns from the matrix according to length squared sampling you have to scale them and that is that scaling I told you uh, to make it unbiased and then you take the M by S matrix again I will have some pictures <coughs> and you do linear algebra you do singular value decomposition but just on those columns okay and so you find the top k singular vectors U1 through UK of C of just that matrix and then that is going to give you a good approximation to A. So you do have to multiply it here by A in the schematic picture but the main brunt of the work you did is doing linear algebra on this matrix which is only S columns instead of that. And um, uh, let's see so again it is not important to get all the exact numbers here but the point is AK is the best approximation you can do from SVD this process which only did SVD of a smaller matrix gives you an error which is the best possible plus a little bit and that little bit goes to 0 as s goes to infinity s is the number of samples right as the number of samples goes to infinity it should go to 0. It turns out the dependence on the s is optimal this was shown by Bar Yusuf he had also many other results on lower bounds uh, using a particular method that he developed. Okay. So uh, no need to absorb the exact thing but if I want to make this epsilon I need only I mean and k is constant epsilon is constant I need only a constant number of samples that is that is a take home. Uh, okay now I, I want to mention this because uh, this is this is specifically for matrices uh, and we do not know an extension. So there is an improvement of this by Rudelson and Vershinen um, where uh, I will run by this as a numerical rank they call it 
That's the Frobenius norm squared over uh, spectral norm squared. Now, in PCA, in principal component analysis, the assumption is only the top 100 singular values are important. In that case, the ratio is constant. And they say you sample a number of rows or columns depending on the numerical rank and do linear algebra on that. U1 through UK are the top case singular vectors of that. And then output this. The one uh, big improvement they make here is for the first time and only time, the right hand side is a two norm, not the Fabianism. And that's very, that's very nice. That's actually an uh, uh, important improvement. But uh, this uses uh, uh, some nice probability in Banach spaces. The uh, nice thing is it uses this machinery. The bad thing is it doesn't extend to tensors then because we don't know how to do that. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice open question to take some of these methods and extend them. Um, there's another result of uh, Shin and one of the co-authors using length squared sampling in a traditional procedure. I won't actually probably give you that. But I want to tell you a different method of sampling by Akioptis and McSherry, which is very nice, which says the following. So in the method I just told you, we picked whole rows or columns. They don't do that. They instead keep the matrix size and zero out some entries. So they do the following. For each entry aij, they associate a probability pij by some means. Then with probability pij, they pick the entry to be included, to be retained. But then if you want to retain it, you scale it up. Okay. And if you don't retain it with probability 1 minus pj, you zero it out. Okay. Now the reason for this is an expectation each entry is preserved. So, the, but the point is the resulting matrix B is sparse. If PIJ is small, many things are zeroed out. But A minus B is a random matrix. Not only that, it has mean zero e for each entry. And that's important. So there's a, a lot of nice theory of uh, random matrices, starting with Wigner and in no bounds on the spectral norm of ra a random matrix. They use that to argue that A minus B, the two norm is small. And again, it's the two norm that we wanted, right? So the two norm is small. So now let's go to tensors. So I said that the uh, length squared sampling is going to be extendable to tensors. So let's look at the tensor problem. Um, again, the point is I've kept the problems that I'm going into in detail somewhat similar to each other so that you know the canvas doesn't completely change every time. So this is very similar to the cut problem, except now we have uh, uh, numbers and we don't have 0, 1. So the central problem is, and I'm going to do it only for four tenses, okay, and this carries over for any, any arity. So we want to find unit vectors w, x, y, z, so as to maximize this quartic form a, i, j, k, l, w, i, x, i, y, j, z, l. Okay. We want to maximize that over all unit vectors. That's the greedy step. That's what we have to peel off. That's the essential algorithmic question. Again, uh, we proceed on the same, we start on the same lines. We observe that if we knew the x, y, z, then the w is obvious. Why is that? In the cut case, it was just row sums being positive, but it's not quite that here. But So if I knew x, y, z, and if I know MATLAB, right, in this kind of notation, this is just going to mean that uh, this is just a vector, right? I, I have uh, already applied x, y, and z to the matrix, uh, to the tensor, and I can get a vector. Okay, the vector w that makes the maximum dot product is just the same vector. It says collinear with this vector, right? So I give you a vector and I want a unit length vector that makes a ma maximum dot product. That's of course the same vector, scale to one. So if I know x, y, and z, I know w. That was always our first step of the argument. The second step, right? So uh, to get w, I have to estimate for each unit vector e i this quantity, that is aijkl summed over xi, xj, yk, zl. Now I'm going to say the sum can be estimated by just having a few terms. We're always going to estimate. This is where the sampling comes in. But here's an important question. Okay. How do we make the variance to be not too high? And the reason this won't follow from the things we were doing is now we could have very disparate entries. Think of the tensor as having only one entry which is non-zero, rest of zero. That's possible, right? Then if I do uniform sampling, I will get no good estimate of this sum, right? 
So how do we make sure that the variance is small? What is the correct probability so that we can make the variance small? Somebody must know the answer, right? No, it's not a... Yeah, yeah, length squared, length squared, right, yeah. No, that's all. I mean, this is just... Uh, so length squared works, yeah. So a version of length squared. So you, you have to be careful what you sum and take the length off. But it's not rows and columns. It's, so, it's the whole... But in any case, uh, you can work out that if the probability is a portion of length squared, the variance is nicely bounded. Okay? Now, once I tell you that the working out is not difficult, uh, that length squared works reasonably. I state that without proof. So that's fine. Now, oh, I, I gave out the answer here. But So uh, this gives us one W. So we started by saying, if I know X, Y, Z, I know W. Then I said, oh, I don't know X, Y, Z, but I'm going to estimate this from just a few entries. Now, I don't know the few entries, but I'm going to draw a length squared sample, and those are my few entries with, with which I'll estimate. All well and fine. By doing all this, I've got, for different candidate X, Y, Z, I've got different candidate Ws. But the Ws I have concretely. X, Y, Z I don't have, right? Those were just some abstract samples existing. But W I have concretely with me. I have several candidate Ws. How do I know which of those Ws I should choose. Okay. So here's a new twist, which is again very simple. Once I have a W, I have only an R minus 1 tensor problem. Okay. I put the W back in. This is like turning it on its head. I put the W back in. I get an R minus 1 tensor problem. I solve it recursively each time, and I get the best candidate. Okay. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of detail, but then you... you uh, with that, you can prove. So here is a summary of uh, 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 low rank approximations to tensors. So for any R tensor where R is constant, we can find in time exponential only in epsilon and polynomial in N, a rank 1 over epsilon squared approximation with this property, with this error bound. Okay. With this approximation, we can do PCA on tensors. So uh, the story for PCA is a little more described in the proceedings as to why these are the right error bounds, but these are, and you can do PCA on tensors. Uh, also, we saw that we can do uh, some generalizations of common total optimization problems we couldn't do earlier. Okay. Now, in the literature on tensors, there's, of course, many heuristics. Uh, by heuristic, I'll mean any algorithm for which, so far, we don't have a proven guarantee for all tensors, right? You can prove some things for some tensors, but uh, uh, in the literature, it would be nice to know, actually, uh, um, something perhaps we can do better, much better than this in polynomial time. This is just one algorithm. It will be nice to know that. It's true that we cannot do everything for tensors that we can do for matrices. And uh, uh, again, in the paper, I have a reference to a paper of Hastert, uh old paper of Hastert, maybe 20 years back, showing several hardness results for, for tensors, that, uh, for problems that you can do for matrices. So clearly, you can't do everything. But it will be nice to know more than just this one algorithm we seem to know for which we can prove guarantees. I mean, other heuristics are like uh, you you take the tensor, throw away the last component, look at the first component, do SVD on many of those matrices, and somehow try to stitch them together. But again, I don't know any proofs that these things give you some error bounds. Okay. Now, uh, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, not SVD now. Suppose I just want to approximate a matrix. Um, this is joint work with Petros. Uh, so singular vectors are linear combinations of rows and columns, right? And in terms of singular vectors, you can approximate a matrix. But one problem among several that they have is singular vectors need not be sparse, even if the matrix is sparse. They can fill up. Okay? Uh, now, in addition, we would like what's called an interpolative approximation. An interpolative approximation is an approximation using a few actual rows and columns of the matrix, not linear combinations of them. Okay. I'll tell you a story in the next slide why this is interesting. And the main result we proved is that if you sample rows and columns as per, well, you would have guessed this, length squared sampling, then in fact you can get an interpolative approximation of any matrix with provable error guarantees. So the picture looks like this. You have a 
big fat matrix, lots of rows and columns A, you can approximate it by some randomly picked columns on this side, randomly picked rows on this side, and a small matrix you put here, which you compute from just the rows and columns. So the model of this story is, if I give you randomly sampled few rows, randomly sampled few columns of any matrix, you can get an approximation to the matrix from that. It's important that it's for any, not for just random matrices. And here I won't state precisely the uh, bounds. Uh, so why uh, why um, see your approximation? Okay, so first of all, it's interpolator. So so here's a little story that these guys uh, like to tell, and I'll come to that. So if you do a principal component analysis on a patient gene matrix, right? That means you know the rows of patients, the columns of gene expression levels, and uh, perhaps there's a big matrix, and you do PCA is something that you do on all such matrices. Once you see a matrix, you do PCA first, and then worry about what good it is, right? So you do PCA, then you can go back to the biologist and say, here or I have found for you 50 linear combinations of patients, or 50 linear combinations of genes, with negative weights and everything. You know, some patients count negatively, some genes count positively, and so on and so forth. And if you add up these things, the, the each linear combination may involve thousands of patients and thousands of genes, and then you understood the whole data, right? And the biologist usually doesn't like this too much. But in any case, these guys, uh, again, uh, Petros Renaeus and Mahoney, who was a postdoc with me, is now at Stanford. And she's a, uh, this person is a biologist. And there's a number of other biologists who are co-authors. I forget, I mean, I forgot the names. And I forget they won't be here. But I, I you know, but there are, this is co-authored with several other biologists, uh, made this argument uh, for a particular problem. And that's, uh, that's something they published in Genome Research. Now, uh, here's another place where you can uh, use random sampling but turned on its head. So a recommendation system, I guess many of you, all of you would probably know a recommendation system. So it's a, you know, uh, I, I don't know, there's this Netflix challenge that people have uh, uh, heard about, no doubt. Although that's a, the, the whole Netflix challenge is a tragedy, but I'll tell you why it is later. I mean, it didn't produce any Fox talk results and didn't, didn't uh, get solved by Fox talk results, but you know, so it is, so such is life. But uh, in a recommendation system, right, you have uh, people, customers, and products, and the whole matrix consists of all things that they ever bought. But of course, that's infeasible to get. You're only given a sample, and uh, Petros Karanidis and Prabhakar Raghavan have a paper, maybe five foxes ago, arguing how you can use these approximations. But now, notice that now the viewpoint is reversed. So far, we assume there is a matrix somebody has written down somewhere. It's too big for us to compute with, so we sample. What these guys are saying is, I don't have the whole matrix. It's too expensive. I only have a sample, and I want to infer the whole matrix, right? And uh, you can apply these sort of results to do that. And uh, there's a nice application of this uh, by um, Christos Philistus and his uh, students, Sun, Z, and Zhang, uh, in a data mining conference. So they use uh, the CUR with one twist. Uh, they do some thresholding to zero out very small entries, and they show that that's very effective in summarizing databases. I think that won them a best paper award actually in that conference. Ah. Okay, here's a uh, here's a off tangent thing. I mean, second talk, I, I might as well do more of these things, right? So, here's a question that we can ask more generally: Should we sometimes include the data collection cost in measuring efficiency? So. Say we have a very large LP, AX less than or equal to B, but I don't give you the data. Uh, each AIJ costs me, let's say, 1 over epsilon squared to get with an error epsilon, right? Then I want to solve this problem. I, I'm given some uh, guarantees. It's not completely wild. I want to solve this problem, but I want to measure the cost of collecting the data as well as solving it. Perhaps that's an interesting thing to uh, see. I don't, uh, uh, I mean, I don't have any results on that. Uh, it just struck me that might be interesting. Okay, now, uh, I, I've said many things you can do with length squared sampling. Obviously, you guess that you cannot do everything with length squared sampling, right? Lots of things you cannot do. But here's a simple thing that you cannot do. Suppose your matrix A consists of all but one row which are equal, and the last row is orthogonal. 
And if I use length squared sampling or almost any kind of sampling you can think of, you'll never see the last row. Okay? There's only one row, right? You'll never see the last row. And therefore, you'll never get a good rank two approximation. I mean, the, the best rank two approximation is the matrix itself, and the error is zero, right? But you'll never see that. You'll only see rank one. Now, you can generalize this example to say, you know, certain percentage of the uh, of the rows or the or the orthogonal ones, and they are perhaps smaller than the other ones, right? And you'll never see it. So, a better criterion, it seems, is a relative error approximation criterion. We want a rank k approximation b to a, so that if a k is the best rank k approximation, then a minus b in um, Frobenius norm is one plus epsilon times a minus a k in Frobenius norm. One plus epsilon times that. Okay, that's a little bit. So you can't get exactly you, you allow, but now relative error epsilon. So question is, can you do that? And indeed, there have been a number of papers showing that you can do it. I will describe one of them in detail, perhaps. So Har Palette has uh, perhaps it was the first linear time algorithm, but it made more than two passes. It made log n passes over the input matrix. And Deshpande and Vampala used order k passes, where k is that rank there, right? Okay. Using volume sampling, and I'll describe this because it's simple to describe geometrically. Um, Dranayas, Mahoney, and Muthakrishnan had a different algorithm. Uh, and here they said, right, this is a more complicated task. I'm willing to spend more time. So they actually took time based on SVD. They did an SVD to figure out the sampling probabilities. Um, then Thomas Charles, maybe two, three foxes ago, had a linear time two-pass algorithm uh, using this uh, very nice random projection uh, matrix that Eilon and Chazelle had developed uh, earlier. And uh, this is called isotropic random projection. I won't describe this perhaps, but this was maybe two or three foxes ago. Okay. That makes only two passes and gets a relative error approximation. Okay, volume sampling. So now this, uh, uh, the reason I'm describing this is very simple geometric thing. It also fixes that pathological example I told you in a simple way. So here's what they do. They sample not one row at a time, but they sample k tuples of rows with probabilities proportional to the volume of the simplex spanned by them. Okay. So in that example, if k is 2, they'll take pairs of rows so that the triangle sampled by them has a particular area. Each row will be taken with probability proportional to the square of that area. Oh, it should be the square of the volume of the center. So it fixes the pathological example. And you can show, and that's a nice proof, that raw volume sampling only gives you a constant uh, factor k approximation, but you can make it work with relative error epsilon. Okay. Now, uh, without focusing on the algorithm part, even the existence part is interesting. So this also proves that any matrix has a set of rows whose span contains a good approximation to A. Right? A set of K rows so that in the span of those rows you have an approximation B so that that's true. Okay? So uh, in numerical analysis there's been a lot of study of this just the existence. Is there a subset of rows or columns of a matrix in whose span we get good approximations? Near non-singularity, good approximations and so on starting with the result of Eisenstadt and Goose. So this contributes to that. Now, there's one issue with this. You seem to have to take n to the k time to figure out all the volumes because the n to the k simplices. But more recently, Deshpande and Radha Maha have improved this uh, where they use some very nice sampling procedure to cut down the running time. By the way, I warned you that the first part of the talk is a little more tutorial type and the second part is a little more survey type. And uh, this is a bit more survey, I realize, without going into great depth into anything. This actually is the last slide, and that uh, might mean I get into this problem of finishing too early, but we'll see what happens. But maybe we'll spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> so here's a problem that uh, spectral methods have been used quite a bit for, uh, but there are some uh, nice open questions that we don't know the answer to. So uh, the problem is the following. Take the random graph G in half. Each edge is in independently with probability half. Okay. We know that the maximum clique is of size 2 log n, but we don't know any polynomial time algorithm to find a clique of size more than log n. It's easy to see that we can find the maximum clique in time n to the order log n okay, for random graph. And the reason is 
they're only of this size. So if I pick every set of two log n vertices and check if it's a clique, sooner or later I'll find one. Now, that's not guaranteeing that that is the very best you can get, right? But with very high probability, there won't be a much larger clique than that. So you check all three log n vertices, you won't find anything, and you say, OK, that's it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, here's a question that people have looked at. Given that this seems hard, let's step back one step and solve what seems to be a simpler problem. Suppose I hide a very large clique of size, let's say, s in g n half. Can we find this hidden clique in polynomial time? So a, a simpler question than that would be, I give you on the one hand a purely random g n half graph. On the other hand, I give you a random graph plus a planted clique. Can you distinguish the two? Okay. Now, if s is very large, you can. So if s is, uh, sorry, I should say first. I, I didn't say one more thing. If s is more than root n log n, then you have telltale signs of the planted clique in just the degrees, right? Just the degrees of the planted clique will be higher than everybody else. That's if s is as large as root n log n, OK? That was too simple, so let's do something a little more complicated. If s is square root of n, constant times square root of n or more, then if you find the top eigenvalue and vector of the adjacency matrix, it turns out you will more or less get more or less, not exactly, but you'll more or less get the incidence vector of the clique. Yeah. Why is that? Roughly intuitively, this is because in the clique, there's a lot of concentrated edges. So if I put a lot of weight in the x and x transpose on the clique, I should get a high sum x transpose ax. And that's what they used to prove that. But that doesn't seem to go below root n. I think maybe they can shave off a log n further. Somebody might, huh? Yeah, root n over log n. Sorry. So this this should be root n over log n. Yes? Yeah. It was a question, not an answer. Any answers? They, OK, maybe. OK, that was my memory. And then I wrote the slide and said, oh, but maybe they shave it. OK, we are right. I mean, so let's say that at most a log n, but we don't know. We don't perhaps know even how to save that with that method. But here is a, a, a partial result that Alan Fries and I proved, which is not finished. And there's one other motivation to worry. Look at cubic form. So let's now construct a three tensor. Since we are uh, uh, you know, looking at tensors, let's construct a three tensor A as follows. I put down for entry i, j, k a plus or minus 1, depending on if the number of edges in the triangle i, j, k is odd or even. In the graph I'm given, I'm given the graph plus the plant, plus the planted clique. I put uh, the parity of the triangle in each entry. Okay? And then we can show that if you maximize this cubic form now over unit vectors, x i, x j, x k here, if you can maximize the cubic form, then the maximizing x will more or less give you the hidden clique. And in fact, we can find the hidden clique from that. Okay? So it's a similar argument to that, except we have to go one level up. I, I, by the way, it's very important that we take this tensor. It doesn't work for other, other types of tensors you can, you can put here. Okay. Then uh, Brubacher and Rempala more recently have shown that you can construct an R tensor by putting the arity of the number of edges in the R tuple of vertices. And that gives you cliques down to n to the 1 over R. Okay, so four tensors will give you n to the 1 over 4 and so on. Now, we did this maybe, uh, Alan Fries and I did this maybe five years ago, and we said, oh, now that we have it in another week, we should be able to optimize. I mean, this, this thing is random mostly, right? right? And uh, most random problems are easy, so we should be able to do it now. But, but we've not been able to do it. It's been uh, five years, obviously, it seems. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's hard. At least to us, it's pretty hard. Okay. But uh, while general optimizing of cubic forms and higher forms might be NP hard, to do it exactly. Here, you have a lot of slope. First of all, this is more or less a random matrix. Secondly, it's enough to uh, optimize within a constant factor. So you have a constant factor slope between, and that's enough. Okay. Uh, but we don't know how to do that. So this, uh, uh, I, I just want to say, it would be nice to do more about cubic forms and higher order forms, uh, optimization of those. Uh, both algorithmically and to find applications. It's just an application, but 
I would think there are quite a few others if you can do that, but uh, we don't know. Yeah? See, but you can do it in n to the log n time, though, right? All these problems. I see. No, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So let me try to press the page down to see if by some chance there are some other slides. But I think that <laughs> <laughs> No, there aren't any. <laughs> I think you have a lot of time for questions. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? Yeah. So the result of uh, Hastrad you mentioned is, is it the tensor rank being NP complete thing? Yeah, I think so. So mm -hmm. does it give any hardness of approximation type things also? Or? Mm -hmm. So good question. So, so suppose I want the cubic form uh, within a certain factor. Is that known to be? Uh, old days in the 70s. It was around for uh, reasons of algebraic complexity. Because if you can, if you can, uh, if you can uh, uh, find the, oh, the rank of a three-dimensional tensor, then you know, for example, how to multiply matrices optimally and so on. Right, I see. Yeah. So it's in this sense that Strasser right. had proposed this problem of finding the rank of a tensor as, uh, and Hastad, uh, I believe he did it for, fi for finite field. Oh, I see. Not for the reals. Yeah, but but I believe that there are results now that that, that do it for oh, the reals. Good point. Yeah. yeah, there are some later. Yeah. So remember, the, result is huh? over and the hardest result was over NP, but just the fact that this in NP was over finite. So oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So hardness was for any. There's a later paper who's Sorry, uh, I think people aren't able to. Can you just repeat, summarize what they said for everyone? Okay. Yeah, so the question was, what did Hastert's result do? He proved NP hardness for any field to get the rank of the tensor, right? But for finite fields, he can show that the rank is an NP. Otherwise, you don't know for sure that it's an NP. Yeah. Yeah. So how close can you get from maximum to form given the techniques you showed us earlier in the talk? Don't think you get us nothing? No, they only give you added, they only do the dense version in something. I mean, this is dense, right? Is dense. But but not that dense because, you know, um, the the error would be, error allowed would be epsilon times n cubed or something like that. There's some normalization because it's unit length like this. But that's too much because the top eigenvalues will be much smaller. There are a lot of cancellations, a lot of plus ones and minus ones. Yes, multiplicative constant factor for this more or less random. Yeah, multiplicative. I mean, there are actually questions of, or there are a lot of local ma local minima when you're doing optimization with cubic forms. We don't know. I mean, that. Yeah. Right. No, so I think for tensors we don't know. So I should have mentioned uh, the first accurate make sure paper they didn't use length squared perhaps, but you can I think there's a later paper of theirs that uses length squared and then they can do better. But I don't know any result for tensors for sparsifying tensors. Now that's a good question. I should have thought about. Uh, I should have addressed that. So the difficulty is. So the nice thing about accurate make sure paper is they use random matrix theory, which is a well developed, very nice theory, right? But the random matrix theory is only a random matrix theory. You don't know what happens for random tensors. So uh, I, that would be an issue. But I think you can use, OK, if they're not very sparse, you can use some of the random matrix techniques to prove also operator norm bounds. So then it might work. It's not being done. It would be interesting to do. Thank you. Thanks.